and welcome to another episode of Adventures in DevOps. This week on our panel, we have Tyler Bird. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week we have a special guest and that is Matt Watson. Matt, do you want to say hello? Hey, what's going on? Uh, I've got a ton going on actually, way too much. But uh, do you want to just uh, introduce yourself, let people know what you do? Yeah, I am the founder and CEO of Stackify, um, which is a... A software development tools company. We actually sell a application performance uh, management tool to software developers. Okay, so yeah, it's an APM, and then I was going to say like this competitor and that competitor. If you're a DevOps engineer, learning is constant. There's always something to keep up on: new technology to manage containers, how to keep everything up to date, what's going on in the Linux ecosystems that you're managing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Educative.io helps with that. They're a platform made from the ground up with software and DevOps engineers in mind. Instead of making you scrub back and forth through videos and spend hours on setup, their courses are text-based and feature live coding environments so you can skip back and forth like a book and practice in browser as you learn. One of the courses I recommend is a practical guide to Kubernetes. Kubernetes can get a little bit complicated and this just breaks it down step-by-step step and walks you through the whole process. It's awesome. They have other courses that cover topics from DevOps to machine learning, system design, and much more. And each course has a free preview so you can poke around free of charge. On top of that, you can visit educative.io slash adventures to get 10% off any course or subscription. Check it out today. But yeah, so I'm, I'm a little curious then. We were talking before the show about just discussing what DevOps is. And I'm, I'm a little curious from the standpoint of an APM system. I mean, how do you look at DevOps and how do you look at what people need to know in order to do DevOps correctly? Yeah. And so, you know, we have a little bit of a different viewpoint because we, we live in this world kind of every day coming at it from a tools perspective, right? And, you know, you're talking about APM specifically, which some people, you know, say, well, that means application performance monitoring, application performance management, you know, different acronyms there. But, you know, usually when you think of monitoring tools, you think of, a sysadmin or, or somebody in IT operations, right, that is monitoring servers, monitoring systems, and it's usually not too much exciting about it. Usually it's more like the fire alarm, right? It's like you don't really need it. You don't really care about it until it's going off, until somebody's hair is on fire and everybody run, runs around in circles. But what most developers don't understand is actually APM tools are actually extremely valuable for application improvement and troubleshooting. Uh, if you have the right kind of tools, they, they can be a godsend for figuring out how to improve software, how to troubleshoot performance issues, how to view log files, find errors, top errors in your software, evaluate you know how a deployment is going. Do we, we have a lot of new problems after deployment? A lot of different things. So you know, monitoring tools are not very sexy and not very exciting, but actually APM products, um, if, if used the right way, can be extremely valuable to a development team. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I've seen that as well, um, Chuck. I, when, I, when I was working at a cloud startup, it would be probably about 10 years ago, um, we, we were partnering with uh, New Relic, actually. And so I, I've seen, I was one of the lead uh, organizers with, with the company that I worked for at the time was called Engine Yard. And yeah. yeah, so so we would give that to people um, who were using the engine yard stack to deploy their Rails apps and then monitor things with, with New Relic. Um, so what do you think has changed in the last, say, 10 years from where New Relic started and where you guys are going today? Well, so a lot of the tools have existed for a long time more for, you know, monitoring transactions in production, right? So if you think about your, somebody like MasterCard and every time somebody swipes a credit card, it needs to happen within, you know, 400 milliseconds or something, or it's a big problem, right? right? So it makes sense to monitor those transactions and, you know, the red, the red phone starts flashing if, if those transactions are taking too long. And those those traditional products were extremely expensive and were really focused on the Fortune 5000 and very operational sort of uh, things. And over the last few years, this kind of technology has what they called shifted left to being used more in development use cases, in QA, and even while writing your while while writing code. 
And and so our, our goal all along has been trying to make the this type of technology more accessible to developers by making it more affordable, but also giving them the types of views and, and data and information that they needed. You know, a lot of these tools, you know, I always looked at were kind of like glorified traffic lights. It's like, okay, are, are things fast or slow? You know, if they're slow, we need to tell somebody. If they're fast, then then who cares? But if you're a developer, you need a lot more than a green or a red light. You got to get down to the code level and the logs and individual transactions and all that sort of stuff. And not all of these tools have really done a very good job of that historically. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so a lot of times when I'll go on these calls to with the companies that I've worked with, I, I, I work at Stark and Wayne and essentially we're consultants in the cloud. And what that does is it allows us to go on site with uh, Fortune 500s and uh, set up their platforms and do these different things. Uh, when we set up these platforms, the, the first thing that everyone wants is automation. Right. And with automation, they, we prioritize setting up the platform maybe in multiple environments like a sandbox and then a QA or pre-prod and then prod. Uh, and what usually finds by, falls by the wayside in these first few weeks of engagement tends to be monitoring more from the platform perspective. You know, what, what kind of, and, and so what kind of tools do you recommend or, or do you see that are useful in the platform perspective? So when you say platform, are you talking about hosting it on AWS or Azure and trying to monitor something like Kubernetes or a, mm -hmm. you know, a platform as a service hosting model? Or what do you mean exactly by that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good refinement. Um, essentially, it can be either the infrastructure as a service or uh, something that you layer on top like a Kubernetes or a Cloud Foundry or Mesosphere or OpenShift, yeah. those type of platforms that you might layer on top of any given IaaS. Um, what do you think the, the space looks for DevOps and, and for monitoring? Is there any good commercial tools? I mean, I had the idea back in my head that you know, Prometheus is essentially a de facto way to monitor the, the platform, but uh, what other tools have you seen out there in your travels? You know, I mean, we... Most of our customers and most of the people we talk to are not really so much worried about monitoring the infrastructure, you know, and, and maybe that's because they're using Azure and AWS and, and those tools make it easy to monitor the, the virtual, the virtual nodes themselves that are say powering Kubernetes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, usually they're coming to us because they're more worried about the applications themselves. And, and we actually do server monitoring as well. So like, the actual nodes of a Kubernetes cluster or something. We we actually monitor those too. It's it's basically free as as part of our product. But um, I don't know. To me, it seems like a lot of these cloud based tools make it pretty easy to monitor the actual servers themselves these days from an infrastructure standpoint. But as a developer, I also feel like we don't even care about the infrastructure. You know, we we just care about our apps, and we expect to redeploy our apps and blow those machines up and create new ones every day. And we're worried more, we're just more worried about is is does our app work and is our app getting traffic? Um, we don't necessarily care about the infrastructure underneath it. Hmm. Yeah, and that's a really good question. Did you have a question, Chuck? Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That, well, that was one thing that I remember. Um, showing up in some of the APM tools that I've used in the past. Um, you know, anything from Nagios, uh, which my coworkers and I all called Nag iOS. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cause it was always chirping at us and uh, you know, or new relic and some of these other ones, right. They, it was monitoring the, the CPU and memory usage across all of our machines and things like that. And ultimately the big gains in performance out of the APMs, you know, it was when we actually looked at the code and figured out ways yeah. to optimize it. And so I've wondered a little bit, yeah, you know, if, if the tool offers that, how valuable is it? Well, and you bring up a good point of something like monitoring CPU, you know, at, at Stackify, we use Kubernetes internally and, you know, if, if CPU is high, we, we would just auto scale and keep adding nodes. So yeah. <laughs> it may look like CPU is never high, <laughs> but all of a sudden we've got, 20 nodes. 
Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's a different dynamic and world we live in. And then, you know, we haven't even talked about serverless too. You got, you know, that whole part of it now. And Oh yeah. Yeah. I want to dig into that with you actually. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that part of it is a, a fad versus it has the staying power, but, um, you know, all of these things definitely change, um, how developers work, what we do. And, um, you know, it's been painful for us figuring out how to use Kubernetes and getting up to speed with that. And we're, we're using Azure, Azure Kubernetes, which makes some of it easier, but there's still a monster learning curve on how to set up a Helm chart and do deployments and set up auto scaling and Kubernetes and all the different things. Like it's just, it's not, it's not, you know, it takes our development team away from their job and kind of forces them to do more DevOps related stuff. Right. You know, configuring Kubernetes is not really something anybody wants to do, but we, but, but we, but we all have to somehow figure out how to do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. I, I agree that Kubernetes overall has affected the industry quite a bit. And I, you also mentioned serverless. Um, I think that uh, serverless is going to be very important in the, in the next few years because of a talk that I actually attended recently in a conference, um, which, you know, all of us come out of conferences with, you know, these, these experiences saying, wow, I've seen the future. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, so I, I, I can take that with a grain of salt in the fact that, you know, I have that feeling quite often. But one thing I did see at a recent conference talking about serverless is that a lot of the platforms have been uh, made sim similar to each other, meaning AWS, GCP, Azure, they all have very similar features. And what most of the time people were doing in the microservice uh, movement was taking the monolith and breaking it down into smaller pieces. Uh, after you have it down in smaller pieces, you could see that, well, we always need some sort of federated identity and we always need a database and we always need these services. And so what they were, what they were finding is that maybe rather than uh, creating any of those services over and over again in a, in a platform that you deploy uh, on one cloud or another, uh, you essentially create an AWS offering for each of those repeated patterns and then allow people to use serverless. And that's where serverless comes in to, to do that. And so serverless executes in such a quick time. I wonder if, if it could spell, I, I was concerned, and here's, here's where I'm going to, is that I was concerned that as a DevOps engineer myself, um, I love to manage the YAML files and Helm charts that, you, that you're mentioning, you know? Uh, but I think that, it, it has the potential to be disrupt, disruptive in both of our industries, meaning that it could be disruptive to say uh, application performance monitors that they're used to having to glue everything back together from distributed places and, uh, and put that all into a, a good report to see the stream as it's going from microservice to microservice. Um, and that with serverless having such a quick execution time uh, that it would replace someone like myself who helps to build and maintain platforms. Um, and so I'm concerned about serverless's future and, and what type of technologies it can replace. Do you have, do you share those concerns? Do you not have those concerns? What do you think about that? Well, I feel like things just get more and more complicated, right? It's, it's, I remember the good old days when I had a couple servers and when I wanted to do a deployment, I logged into my build server named Bob and I did a build and then I X copied some files over to a couple windows. <laughs> you know, I had one branch in my code, man, life was easy back then. And you know, the life of a developer now is so much more complicated um, and all the different things we have to do, but it's, I think serverless is interesting. We have played with some serverless stuff here at Stackify uh, internally. So we actually have some stuff that runs on Azure functions. And honestly, it's been a giant piece of crap and I would not do it again. And if we could go back, we wouldn't have done it. Um, wow. Part of it, but yeah, part of it is we just had a lot of challenges. Like, you know, they do these demos, you know, you, you go to the uh, the conference and you see this demo and you're like, oh, this is revolutionary. And it's like some simple hello world example, right? But then you come come back to the real world and we're trying to, you know, we have sort of a big enterprise product. You know, we've 
kind of big complicated system. And so even the simplest Azure function that's supposed to do some simple thing really needs to access all these other code libraries and, you know, dependencies and whatever. And the next thing you know, Azure functions is like a giant disaster because it has its own code dependencies and references that don't like our code references and dependencies. And, you know, it just causes a lot of complexity. Now, if we were doing everything in JavaScript, maybe life would be easier because everybody says that makes life easier. But in the .NET ecosystem, it, it was kind of very troublesome. Um, and then actually, when we look at the pricing on Azure anyways, Azure functions are more expensive. They're like three or four times more expensive than throwing some stuff on a Kubernetes cluster. So it's not any cheaper either. Now, maybe AWS Lambda is a little more price, um, has a little more price advantage. I don't know. But at least on Azure, not been a fan at all. Hmm, interesting. Gremlin is a chaos engineering service built by engineers from companies like Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Dropbox. To learn more about chaos engineering, join the Slack community over at gremlin.com slash Slack. With thousands of active members, it's a great place to network and find resources to improve your organization's resilience. Comparing the different clouds to each other, um, you bring up, it made me think about interoperability and then, you know, interconnectedness. Because as you mentioned, you know, serverless, it, it's, it won't, it doesn't be, it doesn't become a silver bullet for everyone. You know, there is really no silver bullet in, in software engineering ever. Um, they always come with their pros and cons. Yeah. And, and so do you guys consider being locked in? If, if you're locked into one vendor, do you have like, woes about that or do you have concerns about or do you have like a strategy i guess is my real question uh, to be able to go to multiple clouds and what does that strategy look like for for you and your team well so stackify is a product you know we support our customers on all the different cloud hosting providers and stuff but internally we use azure and we plan to use azure forever and I'm not really the kind of person that engineers things of like, well, one day, maybe 10 years in the future, we might want to change something. So let's make everything 10 times more complicated in case we do decide to switch hosting things, you know, <laughs> 10 years from now, which a lot of developers do that. And that's the whole mentality of every damn thing. And they overcomplicate every damn thing. Are you, are but you calling me an over engineer? Maybe. Yeah, okay. maybe. I, but we, I might resemble that, that question. Yeah. <laughs> <our I> statement. <laughs> I, I mean, want to see that on LinkedIn, over-engineer. Over-engineer, I like it. But I mean, it's I mean, it's a fair point, right? I mean, we, if given the um, options of using, say, Redis, which is more, you know, industry kind of agnostic versus using something that's very Microsoft-focused, I would probably, you know, use Redis for that reason, right? Um, same thing with we use Kubernetes and it's more agnostic. We could have used... Microsoft service fabric instead, maybe, mm -hmm. which seems to have went out of favor. And I don't think near as many people will use it anymore. Um, you know, so we try to use things that are industry agnostic, you know, to, to avoid the, the lock in. But, you know, there are a lot of other things we use that have definitely got us locked in. And you know what, if somebody wants to buy our company someday and then spend 10 years doing some giant migration, then fine. Good luck. They, good luck to them. Sure. Sure. No problem. Um, I, I, I like what you're saying there, though, about just get it done and get it running and then try to keep it stable. Um, I think there's value in that. Uh, I, I've come from a perspective in the last few years of trying to give people so much choice. But really, at the end of the day, a lot of times if it's running and if it's running fine, people are not always going to be over looking over their shoulder of like, boy, it's the cloud is so much shinier over on the other side, you know? Yeah. And but are you guys also a, a Windows shop? Does that kind of help make the decision for you to stay with Azure? Well, so we're definitely a .NET shop, but all of our new apps are .NET Core and Linux. Oh, okay, cool. So, well, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of stuff. Actually, w the vast majority of our stuff actually is all on Linux um, from a percentage perspective. But yeah, we're, we're more of a, dot, a .NET shop, but all the new stuff is in .NET Core and Linux. Okay. internally cool. yeah now our for our customers we support six different programming languages so our, our customers use everything all over the board but 
So do you, uh, do you guys manage like a points of presence all around the globe and being, I would imagine like a globally utilized company? So, yeah, good question. So we have, we have customers in over 60 countries, um, but we're just hosted in Azure in one region. That's it. Um, one of our goals though, is to get into uh, using Azure in some other regions. That's one of our goals. We've, we've got a potential client that's, that we're working on signing up now that might kind of force us into a different region mm -hmm. to support them. It, it is increasingly a question with, you know, regulatory stuff. We don't really um, collect sensitive data. Mm -hmm. um, mostly what we collect is kind of metric kind of data, right? Like this thing took this amount of time. Um, but still people, you know, in certain countries are really super sensitive about any data leaving their, you know, their uh, leaving the country. So. Right. Absolutely. So when you're talking about being in one region right now, um, are most of your clients here in the U S so that the latency for application monitoring, cause the places I've used before, like Datadog or those type of things, you essentially point to an API and, and you're injected through both an app agent on the machines and out to an API. Do you guys follow that same kind of model? And then how does that model being just in like one core region here for now affect your latency, you know, since that's a concern with application performance monitoring? Yeah, so we're probably about half of our customers are in the United States, but really that just impacts the primarily the latency of our data collection. But, you know, that's, you know, the way our software is installed is, you know, an agent is basically installed on their servers and, and collects the data and then, you know, aggregates that data, compresses it, and then sends it up to us. So if it takes an extra 50 milliseconds for that data to upload, it's, it's not really going to matter. Um, it doesn't slow down their app or, you know, anything like that. It's, it's right. just a background process that runs and uploads it to us. So, I mean probably the biggest impact would be them using our, our user interface, right? Logging into our software would be a little, uh, would be a little speedier. Now we do use Cloudflare for that and, and Cloudflare helps optimize that in, in, you know, to some degree helps optimize our user interface, but. Yeah. I don't know why I immediately thought, Oh, well, all of their, their stats have to be real time because they don't necessarily have to be real time. You're essentially draining the logs from the places yeah. and, and importing them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we consume billions of points of data a day between log messages and metrics and APM data and all that stuff. So yeah, a lot of data processing going on. Uh, what kind of technologies do you guys use to, to house all that data? What are your uh, primary in, inboxes and then like data lake type of things? Yeah. So today we accept the data and, and then we immediately queue it um, in, in Azure storage. And then we have, background services that process it and then ultimately save it in either uh, a SQL database or Elasticsearch. We use Elasticsearch for a lot of things. Um, we're in the process now of trying to move some things to Kafka and playing with Kafka. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited about some things there and what, what it'll help us do. But yeah, a lot of it right now just ends up in Elasticsearch and SQL. Cool, cool. Now, do you guys do... You're, you're get, with application performance monitoring, the traditional you know core feature set is essentially be recording everything that's happening and then do some sort of alerts on thresholds. Um, and so pe the I can deploy my app, the app is running, and it's it's basically like having the the tape deck you know always running like mm -hmm. a, a camera system, and then you can always go back and 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 look at it in the past tense. Um, do you guys, are you guys starting to employ machine learning or AI to analyze those type of things and, and give them, give the users patterns or reports? I, that's just something that popped in my head. I was wondering what you might say about that. Yeah. So we, so to your example there, we do record basically all the transactions that happen. So we, we record all those transactions and we crunch all that data and summarize it and analyze it. We don't currently do any machine learning today. That doesn't mean we don't have different algorithms and stuff like that that we do. And maybe those are a different type of machine learning, but um, really what we're focused on more so than the monitoring is, is what we would call continuous application improvement. We really want to help the developers figure out how to improve their software um, you know, give them suggestions on, you know, this database query needs to be improved or the performance of this thing got worse after a deployment, you know, these errors are, are very high error rates. Um, you know, all those sort of things of, of telling them how to improve their application. 
more so than just the monitoring aspect of it. And so we're, you know, those are the, the kind of algorithms that we're mostly focused on is, is giving them smart suggestions on how to improve their software. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I was just, uh, yeah, totally. Um, well, so one thing that I'm looking at with this, cause I've thought about building like a podcast analytics system, right? And so it probably look, if you squinted at it, somewhat similar to Stackify, right? Where I have um, systems reporting in um, podcast stats and then, you know, I have a dashboard for people to go and get the information and, you know, and I have tools that make sense of it and things like that. So, uh, you know, what kind of a DevOps setup are you looking at? Do you have like separate apps for collecting the data, um, making sense of the data and then displaying the data or is it all kind of in the seamless system or how does that go together? Yeah, good question. So internally we have a bunch of APIs. We have, um, a user interface that people log into and we actually changed our web interface and actually sort of carved off part of it into sort of its own microservice. You may call it not really microservice, but you know, just kind of, we split the baby up. And so one part of our system is um, a different app actually, but when you log in, you would never know. It's kind of transparently two different apps um, just so we could carve off, carve it in half. Um, we, we really had two kind of big monolithic APIs. And really what we did is um, five or six of those transactions are super high volume. You know, like every time metrics get uploaded or log data or something like that, those are super high volume. And we actually carved those off into kind of their own microservices. I mean, you you just have a religious war, I guess, about what the Mm -hmm. word microservice means, but um, they're basically a separate app that just does that one thing, that one transaction that we just scale that, you know, the heck out of that one transaction. Right. For us, that's kind of the microservice doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have a shared database or whatever, but um, yeah, we've, we've kind of split the baby up that way. And then we have a bunch of backend services that are queue based or timer based kind of scheduled jobs, things like that. So we probably have probably 20 different applications that actually kind of run everything. Um, a lot of, most of all of it's actually background stuff, a lot of background processing. So how big is your DevOps team at Stackify? Zero. So do you distribute the de- DevOps roles and tasks to different, uh, full stack engineers and that kind of stuff? Yeah. So total, we have about probably 25 software engineers. Um, and you know, we use pretty much everything as platform as a service sort of stuff. So like on Azure, we use, we've used Azure cloud services. We use Azure app services and then we use Kubernetes. Um, you know, so we use tools like Team City and Octopus Deploy to do deployments. So, you know, yeah, there's some work in configuring those deployments and, you know, scripting them out and stuff like that. But once they're in there, our, de- our developers just, just use those. And, you know, basically we have a couple developers that spend half of their time writing code and the other half the time, you know, pushing the deployment buttons and helping with other you know, deployment related tasks and project management and things like that to go along with it. But we don't have any truly dedicated DevOps people. We actually want to hire a couple people this year dedicated to just, you know, application monitoring and security and policy and procedures and DevOps and all that sort of stuff. But we just haven't quite got there yet. Yeah, I kind of have this theory, Chuck and, and Matt, is that um, classroom size companies, meaning that if there's about a classrooms full of uh, engineers, tend to distribute DevOps code around a DevOps tasks and chores until they get to a certain breaking point. Right. And if you will have to separate the class or break above a classroom size, then usually that's where people start to hire full-time, full-time people. Um, you know, but it's good to be a victim of your own success, right? You know, as you, as you scale bigger and grow bigger, you, you need some of those, some people to, to do those things for you. Well, and a good example of that is the learning curve we had with something like Kubernetes, you know, instead of having one of my developers spending a lot of time figuring all that out, it would have been nice to have a, a DevOps engineer or system admin or somebody, you know, spending all their time jacking around with that stuff instead of one of my lead software engineers. Mm -hmm. That's, that would have been very helpful. Yeah. I recently talked to a guy on LinkedIn and I was saying, what if we had a a business that could, you know, split apart DevOps 
you know, architects into different companies. And he said, well, companies that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave names off to protect the innocent, but companies that focus too much on DevOps at the beginning usually don't succeed. And I found that a bit concerning as somebody who's a bit of a DevOps art artisan, you know, in a way, I really enjoy the DevOps stuff. And I like to be able to come into a place where I can help with those processes and, and help mature, mature them and, and become more um, reliable. Uh, but speak, you know, you also are running a podcast called, uh, what was the name of your other podcast? The Startup? Startup Hustle. Yep. Startup Hustle. Yeah. And so in startups in your experience, um, do you think that focusing on DevOps at the beginning is a mistake? I think you need to do the minimum amount of stuff to get up and going, but the more you can use platform as a service stuff, you're far better off, right? Like if you can go to AWS and use Fargate or Elastic Beanstalk or something like that, even if it maybe costs a little more than just getting your own VMs and can deploying directly to your own VMs, it's, it's way smarter because you don't want to spend weeks trying to figure out all that crap and setting up your own Kubernetes cluster or whatever to save a few dollars a month. It's not, it's not worth the, there's no ROI in it. Um, and I think that's why you have people that ne- they gravitate now to things like AWS Lambda that are like, oh, I can just throw this thing up there. I don't have to think about scaling it. I don't have to think about infrastructure. Like you mentioned Engine Yard earlier. I mean, that's another good example of those, those platform as a service things. And that's where we start out with Stackify. That's why we used Azure Cloud Services like eight years ago is it's like, I didn't want to deal with any of the infrastructure or any of that. I just want to be able to right click deploy my app. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, and now we can script that with team, team city or octopus deploy or something like that. Are you stuck at home climbing the walls when you should be hanging out with the community at the latest conference to get canceled? Are you wondering where to hear your JavaScript heroes like Amy Knight and Douglas Crockford and Chris Heilman? After the cancellations, I decided to put on a JavaScript conference for you online. I invited my favorite folks from around the web and got them to come speak at an online event just for you. Go to jsremoteconf.com and check out our speakers and schedule. The conference is on May 14th and 15th. The call for proposals is open until March 31st. Come join us at an online conference that we guarantee will keep you safe and keep you informed. JSRemoteConf.com. Yeah, I think I think you just have to look at doing the minimum amount of stuff along the way. I've got a friend that owns his own software company, and he uh, he like built his own little sort of like performance monitoring tool and his own little way to collect errors and logs and whatever. And it's like why do you spend time on this crap when you could sign up for some sort of tool super cheap? And, but that's the way developers are, right? They're like, instead of buying this, you know, tool for $500, I'll spend the next three weeks of my life. (laughs) You know, developers fall into that trap. Yeah, they can. And that's why it's good to have a good PM and good leadership to help rein them in. Yeah. Um, Because they're, uh, in my experience as an engineer, I, I want to solve the hard problems and I do want to dive deep and dig into it. And so, yeah, it is, it is a pretty consistent struggle, I would say. Yeah, there's, there's an endless supply of, of different tools that are out there that are available and developers have to resist the urge of trying to re-engineer these tools that exist. Instead, we need to figure out how to use these tools as, as building blocks to build something you know bigger, not re-engineer all these little tools. Yeah, I think that we've we're entering a bit of a golden age of the fruit of DevOps labor. So 10 years ago, we didn't have any of these systems and uh, AWS was essentially compute, storage and uh, networking, you know. And even the networking didn't come in until a few years ago and being able to do like your own virtual private cloud. So so I think that we are now reaping the benefits of, of so much of this DevOps and, and reliability engineering all in the clouds. And I, that talk led me to believe about serverless that as we go forward, um, building platforms locally and that type of stuff won't, the, the big players will, will take over. Uh, AWS, uh, Azure, and, and GCP are, are all competing for on-prem as well you know, being able to run GCP or Azure 
in your data in your own data center rather than than uh, running it out on the cloud. And so for they're trying to attack into the the percentage of people that essentially are like, well, I I can't ever put anything on the public cloud because uh, of requirements and and uh, compliance and all these different things. Well, I have a I have a a, a, a kind of different and similar theory, and I have a question for you first. So you said about ten years ago you were working with Engineard, right? Yeah. So primarily with Ruby developers. Uh, that was their biggest share. And then we expanded into Node and PHP. Yeah. So if I'm a Ruby developer, what is different today with using, say, Kubernetes than it was using Engine Yard 10 years ago? Wasn't it just as easy 10 years ago to deploy to Engine Yard as it, maybe it is now with Kubernetes? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that 10, 10 years ago, we didn't... A lot of the Ruby on Rails were moderately... Uh, a hybrid between the megalith, you know, you know, a monolithic type of machine that that just has everything in it except for the database, and starting to split things into microservices. Um, and I think that we Docker has informed us a lot of uh, in a lot of ways as to being able to repeatedly build the mm -hmm. um, the what we call build packs or doing the build pack pattern. And so nowadays. Um, we just we have a, a good image to start from, and and so it in the the infancy of of Ruby deployment, um, there was a lot of confusion about which Rubies to use and and which way to use it and and to try to get more performance out of it before it had been performance tuned uh, a little bit. I mean, Ruby's still never going to beat C or Java. Um, you know, with compiled jar files and those type of things, but uh, but it's still gotten better. So I think a, a lot of it is, as it goes back to what you mentioned, is there are a lot of things that have improved in the in the last little while that have made it easier for people. And now, as you mentioned, with like all the integrations uh, and OAuth, probably could be another huge piece. Uh, being able to set up set up that federated identity and 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 be secure with those type of things so that you can use team team city and and other tools to to deploy or or actually push con code to production so well and i think part of my point is as a developer all i care about is deploying my app i don't care about the infrastructure right and so the reason i used azure cloud services eight years ago is it made it easy to do that i could say i want to deploy this app and i want one server or ten i don't care about any of them i just want to deploy my app right and engine yard helped solve that same problem really what kubernetes has done is sort of leveled the playing field and actually, I would say hurts the ho these hosting providers because part of Engineard's strategic superiority was that we had an e they had an easy way to do that for Ruby. Like if you want, wanted an easy way to deploy a Ruby app, Engineard was one of your few choices. Now you could deploy it in a container to Kubernetes literally anywhere. Mm -hmm. And Engineard doesn't have much of a strategic advantage anymore, right? right? Same thing with Azure and their cloud services. Well, now I can deploy my .NET Core app on Linux in Kubernetes, and I don't need to use Azure. Azure doesn't provide me really any benefit. And by the way, .NET Core on Linux on Azure is like a fourth of the price as an Azure cloud service mm -hmm. because of that. So part of my point is like the early days of the cloud, one of the big values that, that they provided was the ease of deploying an app versus the servers, right? Well, now Kubernetes has sort of leveled the playing field and said, look, this is universally how everybody is going to deploy apps. They're going to put them in a container. They're going to deploy them as, as Kubernetes. And actually, I would say that that's a big threat to these hosting providers because if you can use Kubernetes literally anywhere, couldn't any telco little data center say, look, yeah, we support Kubernetes. Come, come bring your app, deploy it. Like, what then is the advantage of using AWS or Azure anymore if these, you know, any little hosting company can provide nearly the same functionality? Okay, I think I, I think I could talk to that and try to keep it brief because, like I mentioned, I can over-engineer software and I can over-engineer answer just as well. Um, but I went to the KubeCon this last year and at KubeCon, there were, you know, 
every every company's there. Everybody's hungry to try to get their piece of Kubernetes. And what's yeah. important to understand that is that while it has been a unifying thing, it's, it's almost like saying, okay, well, I'm going to deploy my boat to the ocean um, versus deploying to a specific lake. And we have all these different lakes where people have deployed their apps to recently, and there are, some lakes are bigger than others. You know, it's Lake Superior. You know, you could say all of the the clouds are the big lakes, but now they want to go to the big ocean of Kubernetes. Well, there's a lot of danger, in my opinion, of thinking that Kubernetes is is a is a magic bullet that could solve all the problems. It's actually a bit more like a, a Jenga game. And when everything starts out, you basically have the API and the worker nodes and everything looks you know, rock solid. But as you start pulling out the pieces and moving things around, you start to see that uh, things get more and more dangerous the further you go along, which I, which I mean to say that um, you're putting on all these different things onto Kubernetes. And if it overstresses the, the networking service, Calico, to the point where all communication is shut down. So um, Kubernetes is a very complex program and requires a lot of attention to detail. And I think uh, people like myself are gonna be trying to solve those problems and make them easier. There was a technology called Cloud Foundry. It's still a technology and I still in, enjoy using it, um, but it is never, received the same kind of uh, acclaim and fame as, as Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And, and it essentially answered that question, Matt, that you, that you want, which is I'm a developer. I just want to deploy it. I don't care how it happens. And so Kubernetes is not making the deployment any easier for, for people at this time, but there is a lot of tooling going on in this arena, arena to try to emulate some of the great lessons we've learned from, from the cloud foundry platform uh, to bring those to the Kubernetes world. Like, it feels like we're getting closer and closer. Yes, yes. And I think the next 10 years for DevOps is going to be freaking amazing. So I'm super excited about it. Well, and does it, it, it comes back to your original question is of how does it change DevOps, right? Of, is there less, less DevOps work to do? Is there more, more DevOps work to do or less DevOps work to do as we perfect these things? Right. I don't want to keep going up and down the stairs that we've already done. I'd rather get to the top floor, right? Uh, I don't want to keep going between floors one through three anymore. I agree with, with that sentiment that it's not, it's not any good to, to reinvent the wheel. So, yeah, I think, I think we have a lot of great potential for where we're going to take things with reliability and operations in DevOps. Um, but I think what's crucial to all of this is that we come together as communities and not all try to solve all of the problems independently. And one of the things that kind of happened to speak back to our points before in the Ruby world was um, there was Ru Ru Rails as the framework and uh, Merb, and they were competing frameworks. And ultimately, they joined forces to to become, you know, the Rails um, mm -hmm. mega framework. And so I think things need to kind of coalesce in, in the Kubernetes space and the cloud native uh, and the cloud native uh, compute foundation is working hard to try to show which ones of these technologies are the most mature in their life cycles. Uh, they actually have a really cool website, which I guess we could, we could go into our picks at this point. Uh, uh, and I would pick, it's called landscape.cncf.io. And landscape.cncf.io will actually give you the landscape of all the cloud native stuff that's going on right now in the Kubernetes space and in cloud native. And it tells you where things are in their maturity spectrum so that if you are trying to adopt a specific type of technology, you're like, okay, we'll stay away from that one. It's just barely, and it has three scales, uh, like uh, beginning, incubating, and graduated, something to that effect. I can't remember the names, but but yeah, that would be one of my main picks today. Um, and another pick that I have is uh, GitHub just released a, a CLI. Um, and so it's in, it's in beta right now, but essentially you can pull and push to GitHub with the CLI. That, now there has been a tool in the past called Hub, and Hub has has been able to provide a lot of these type of things like you, from the command line, you can open up your issues, you could write to an issue, you could, you could submit a pull request and all that kind of stuff. But now, you know, as, as we all know, Microsoft bought GitHub in the last couple of years, uh, it's, it looks like they're, they've 
invested in a CLI and I, I'm looking forward to playing with that. I haven't uh, touched it yet. It was just announced today, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to sending that out. So. That sounds like a horrible idea to me. <laughs> well, I love, I live in the command I'm the guy line. that I hate command line. So, uh, yeah, well, you know what? It takes every, it takes a village to yeah. deploy an app, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm that guy that, uh, when I see somebody on hacker news that wrote some command line, VI app or whatever to read their email or Gmail. I'm like, what in the hell are you people doing? Yeah. Please send all, all my SMS texts to the command line. What are you doing? But you know, but you know what, if that's what people like, then, you know, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've worked with people that, yeah, they use command line interfaces to check their email and yeah, I don't necessarily understand that, especially (laughs) the web, the web, I mean, I have web tools that add so much more on top of the email that just I'm waiting. I hope they don't use smartphones either. I hope they use like a, a 10 key phone and they uh, 10 oh, key their command line to just get text back. I, think, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I resemble yeah. a lot of that in the command line thing. <laughs> I'm actually using a, another tool that helps you move those things around, but I think I'll save that for a future pick. The great thing about command line is automation, just being able to script and automate yeah. things. I see a lot of value in that for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the whole point, right? Is that I use web tools on my email to automate stuff. And yeah, I use command line tools to automate stuff. Yeah. I'll throw in some picks here. So uh, the first pick that I have um, I'm going to pick it again. I picked it last week is the clean coders podcast. We started it on uh, devchat.tv. There are currently five episodes available as we record this. So uh, definitely check that out. And then I've been um, working on a few things. One of, one of them, um, I keep helping people prepare to find jobs or prepare to get interviewed or things like that. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I find that really helps people if they're going to a company that seems to have a deep care for CS pedigree, um, they, they ask questions that you're going to learn getting a CS degree that, you know, unless you're working in very specific instances, you're probably not going to run into during your regular career. And so, um, you know, they ask all kinds of data structure algorithm questions and, you know, big O notation and stuff like that, you know, And uh, anyway, there's a great company out there that does this. It's called Interview Cake. And so I'm going to shout out about Interview Cake. And yeah, I'm I'm really digging it. So um, I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. Um, And Matt, um, we we should probably get some picks from you as well. Can I pick Stackify? Is that a fair pick? Fair enough. Yep. (laughs) Well, I told you elevator pitch. Yeah, I mean, I, we talked about it earlier, but I mean, you know, our, our goal is is to help developers learn how to improve their software, troubleshoot performance issues, you know, hopefully um, even use our tools in development and QA. Um, we actually have a free tool called Prefix, which is super powerful. Uh, it's a type of uh, tracing profiling tool developers can use on their on their laptop and it's and it's completely free. So um, that would be my pick is um, it's definitely kind of a, a really nice tool to have in your toolbox if you're a developer. So nice. Anything that's not stackify that you want to pick? Um, book, TV show. Can I, can I pick Kubernetes? Is that a fair pick? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, actually, you whatever I, you want. I, I'm actually a big fan of, of Kubernetes so far. Um, you know, we've been using Azure cloud services and other things, and there's been a learn a learning curve with going to Kubernetes, but we've got a lot of production workload uh, running on it. And um, so far so good. It's, it's been great. And I actually think it does kind of level the playing field for a lot of these hosting providers and stuff. You can deploy your stuff anywhere in Kubernetes and make it very kind of a uh, industry universal sort of thing, which is great. So. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, did I kick this thing off or did you, Tyler? I think uh, I you did. did. So let's let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thanks for coming, Matt. This has been fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was right. a pleasure meeting you. Yeah. Well, we'll have another one next week, folks. And in the meantime, Max out. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.